think we'll move on to the second talk and then we'll see how we're doing on timing. I think we're not doing too badly. Uh, and then harvest questions. And I think if we do the same thing we did previously, if you have questions, write them on a card and then we'll see how the time works out. So Professor Yashin Huang from uh, MIT, an economist who was given a rather difficult challenge because we were trying to broach these broad issues of the cultural meeting and um, I think has thought a lot about it, but perhaps in a very different way, but again, it's from the point of view of sort of what, are the, what is the economist thinking about it? So, so on. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Irvin and uh, Mark, for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, conference. Uh, and I told the organizers that I, my work is not really on energy, nor it is on culture. But energy is so important <laughs> in any research project on Chinese economy, you, you have to uh, pay attention to it. So let me just sort of... A, um, uh, describe uh, what are some of the implications of the Chinese economic model and for energy demand, for energy as a driver of economic growth. And, and, and so this is uh, the agenda. So let me, let me use the time efficiently and try to get through uh, these uh, slides without going through each detail of the slide. And there's a debate uh, at least probably here about what is driving the energy demand in China. And that you could argue that there are two different uh, ideas about the driver of the energy demand. One is uh, driven by culture. And uh, if you buy that view, uh, the logical implication of that is much of the energy usage uh, in China is in the household. Right? So basically the Chinese people. Uh, the view there is that because of certain particular conception of savings and consumption, then much of the energy uh, usage is there. That's not where China is. Uh, and I'm going to show you some uh, data. Uh, vast majority of the energy use is in the industry, in the manufacturing industry. And which suggests that the uh, driver of the energy demand is more in the area of uh, government policies, incentives, pricing of the capital, environmental regulations, and things like that. Those, you could say, can be endogenous of culture, but the proximate cause for the energy demand is currently, at least, is in the uh, development uh, model, economic development model. Um, and you could make the argument, although we don't know whether this is true or not, you could make the argument that for China to move to a less energy intensive uh, model of economic growth, you may want to move from the development, development model driver of energy demand to a cultural driver of energy demand. You could argue, although, uh, again, we don't have data. Maybe other people have data, but at least I don't know of the, the, the research that illustrates this. You could argue that the Chinese, uh, for whatever cultural reasons, are more conservative in terms of their usage of uh, energy. And, you know, there's some probably superficial data to support that. One is that uh, Chinese people, and, and this is not true just Chinese people in China, Chinese people uh, everywhere have very high savings rate, right? So there's a, you can say, uh, there's a fixed effect. At any income level, you observe higher savings rate among the Chinese population as compared with Western uh, population. And you could argue that Chinese, uh, for cultural reasons, are more conservative. And we, had, we, we did some survey on rural migrant workers in Guangdong province in the last two years. 
And our survey shows that the rural migrant workers, uh, and this is fairly low income group, uh, they don't use much energy at all. Uh, one data point is very, very uh, illustrative. The average um, uh, electricity consumption per month in the survey that we conducted by an average sort of a rural migrant uh, household is only 70 kilowatt hours. Um, you know, there are energy experts here in the room. They can, they can, they can uh, tell us better what, what that means. For the U.S., I think it's something like a thousand. So the, the difference is, uh, is, is dramatic. But, but the problem there is that we couldn't really distinguish between the cultural effect or the income effect. This is low income. Maybe they consume very little energy because of the low income or because of the culture. And we don't really have a way of currently of uh, telling which, which one is driving this uh, behavior. Uh, MIT, Tsinghua University, and uh, Cambridge, we have a low carbon uh, alliance research project. Uh, and Tsinghua University professor and I actually applied for a, uh, for a grant to study the Chinese household behavior. And, but the problem there is that uh, the people who are working in the area of uh, low carbon and energy, they are mostly engineers and scientists. They don't think this uh, sort of culture and social issues are that important. So we didn't get a grant, and, and therefore we don't, uh, I can't really tell you uh, anything about that. But, so, but, but I think this is a pity because uh, we actually need to find out more about the Chinese household behavior. And for a very specific reason, and that reason is there's worry that uh, as the uh, Chinese economy is getting stronger, the growth is fast, there's worry about, uh, oh, what are the implications of bringing 1.3 billion Chinese into the consumption, um, uh, consumption uh, 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 basket. Uh, and then the worry there is that this is unsustainable. I would argue that the whole problem is that we don't have 1.3 billion Chinese consumers. We have too many Chinese firms using too much energy, and they export and now they are increasingly engaged in the production activities in the real estate infrastructure building whose consumption benefits only go to maybe top 10% of the Chinese uh, population, top 10% of the Chinese uh, households. And the whole problem is uh, there is not enough consumption. The only way to make that hypothesis correct is to demonstrate that the Chinese households have a relatively conservative consumption culture. And there, we don't have data, right? So this is where I think it's a very, very significant mistake for the people who are working in the energy arena to think that this is only about technology, this is only about the um, sort of supply side of the issues rather than demand side of the issues. And then I'm going to show you some uh, data on uh, energy intensity of uh, GDP, and then make the argument that much of the substantial increase of the energy intensity of the GDP. Really, actually, you look at the data. Uh, the data show that the, the substantial increase of the energy intensity of the GDP only happened since the late 1990s. Before that, there was actually a decreasing trend of the energy intensity intensity of the GDP, even though the GDP was growing at 8%, 9% a year. It is simply not right to say that for Chinese economy to grow at 8%, 9% a year, you need a very high level of the energy consumption. Conditional on the fact that the economy is going to grow at 8 or 9% a year, how you design the policies and how you design incentives and how 
basically how you price the capital. I mean, I think the big problem in China is that capital is massively subsidized. So there's a huge incentive on the part of the firms to go into capital intensive projects. So when you do that, uh, you can still have 10%, 9% GDP growth, but you use more energy, right? So it is simply not right to say that you need this much energy to attain 8% growth. China, for the first 20 years of uh, economic reforms from 1978 to 1998, basically had very high growth, but the energy intensity was declining. And since then, the energy intensity is rising. And then I'm going to say a little bit about what exactly that model is. Basically, uh, it is a model known as uh, state capitalism. Uh, state-owned enterprises uh, invest on a massive scale, uh, supported by a state-controlled financial system, subsidized the financing. I think this is the, the main issue. This, is the, this particular way of growth is the main issue. And China didn't have that uh, for the first uh, 20 years of the reforms. And since then, the country has uh, more of that economic de development model. So in order to change that, it requires many fundamental institutional changes. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges for this model. And one of the consequences of this model is actually consumption decline. When you look at the data, what you see is at the time when Chinese energy intensity is increasing, this is precisely the time when the Chinese consumption as a ratio to GDP is declining. It's very difficult for me to accept the view that it is the Chinese consumption that is driving the energy intensity. It's actually the Chinese production and the way that the production is financed and organized that is the, the problem. And then there's the issue about urbanization and, and things like that. I'll go very briefly over some of these uh, issues. So let me just show you some very uh, high level um, uh, data. And as you can see that uh, I have four countries there. Uh, at the bottom we have uh, China. Next is uh, India and then we have the United States, and then we have Japan. Basically, this is GDP per unit of uh, energy use. And as you can see, Japan, has, this is no surprise to anyone, Japan has a very high level of uh, uh, GDP uh, uh, energy ratio because the Japanese economy is very, very efficient. Uh, one of the views that, uh, and, and China is at the very bottom, um, one of the views that is sort of circling around is, oh, Chinese energy uh, uh, intensity of GDP is high because China has a manufacturing economy. Japan has had a very uh, heavy manufacturing economy, and yet they figured out how to use energy efficiently as a, uh, as a, as a, as a per unit of uh, GDP generated, right? So it's, you know, conditional on having a large manufacturing economy. There are ways of using more energy, there are ways of using less energy, and Japan figured out a way of using less energy. U.S. is the next, no matter what Tom Friedman says about the uh, China leading the energy, uh, green energy, U.S. is way ahead of China in terms of this measure of uh, energy efficiency. Uh, India, you know, this is not a country that we usually consider as a very efficient uh, economy. India is way ahead of China uh, in terms of uh, uh, GDP generated per unit of uh, energy used. As you can see, so, so there's this sort of cross-country differences. And the over time changes are also interesting. As you can see, um, uh, as an MIT professor, I usually have troubles using technology. Uh, I forgot how to use this. Um, uh, as you can see, um, yeah, okay. Beginning in the late 1990s, uh, the GDP uh, per unit of energy use declined. And then it went back. So basically, there's this period of uh, setback. I think it's very important to pay attention to this period and find out exactly what happened. Right? So, uh, 
and, and, and I think it involves a change in economic policy, a change in economic development model. Um, this is uh, uh, energy consumption per capita. Um, I think it makes sense to compare China and India in terms of the per capita uh, data rather than per uh, GDP because these are broadly similar economies, they are developing economies. Uh, as you can see that the two countries are roughly, the, the, dark, the darker blue line is uh, China and this is, uh, uh, this is India. Uh, and this is the level rather than a ratio. As you can see, you know, the two countries roughly track each other uh, until the late 1990s. And then something happened since the late 1990s that got China onto this very high growth path in terms of the, uh, at least in this, that's the only data I can find, road sector energy uh, consumption, right? So something happened uh, here that created this divergence between the two countries. In India, you know, uh, again, India began uh, the GDP, uh, high GDP uh, growth uh, around this, this period, uh, and uh, they were able to uh, maintain a relatively stable, I mean, all, all of these things are in relative terms, relatively stable uh, energy consumption. So, uh, really how you organize the economy, how you price capital, how you price land has a huge effect on energy use, conditional on high growth. Uh, this is uh, another way of telling the story. So there's a, basically there's almost all the data that I have seen, there is a sharp break. Some, some, sometimes the data show the break happened uh, in 2002, 2003. Sometimes the data show that some data series show that the break happened in the late 1990s, but something happened that, uh, that put China on a slightly different path as compared with before. Uh, electric power uh, consumption, you see exactly the same thing. Um, and this is more uh, on import, it's less important uh, for, uh, for this audience. The only takeaway of this slide is that even though China, in terms of percentage, imports less energy uh, as compared with India. Chinese economy is, is three times uh, the Indian economy, so it has a bigger effect on commodity prices, on energy prices, even though as a percentage, it imports less energy as compared with India. India has, has, has very little effect on the global commodity uh, prices. What is also interesting is, uh, you know, again, I'm not an energy expert, so I, I, I talk to, when I talk to people who know a lot more than I about this uh, topic, I ask them whether or not the rise of Japan had, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, had a huge effect on the global energy market, right? So the view, if you talk to investment analysts, investment bankers, their view is that the Chinese growth is going to imply sort of permanent long-term co uh, high commodity prices, right? And high energy prices, high commodity prices, iron ore, uh, uh, oil, and things like that. When you ask energy uh, economists about Japan, whether the rise of Japan had a similar effect, and the answer basically came back and said zero. So Japan actually had very little, the rise of Japan had very little effect on the permanent uh, energy prices, in part because the Japanese rise was accompanied by very high level of energy efficiency. The reason why I belabor on this point is that we need to make a distinction between economic growth and energy efficiency. A lot of people focus on economic growth when probably the more important driver is the efficiency with which you use energy rather than uh, growth. Because otherwise, it will be a very unpleasant picture, right? Otherwise, it will be very unpleasant trade-off. Are you willing to tell the Chinese and Indians, stop growing, right? And because that's, that doesn't seem to be a fair and equitable 
a position for developed countries to take, right? But the problem is that many people operate on that assumption that somehow economic growth is the problem rather than the efficiency. If the efficiency is the problem, then you can achieve growth without, uh, achieve improving living standards without sacrificing uh, environment. Um, so there's some data uh, that suggests that there has been an acceleration of energy intensity since the late 1990s. And there is also data which I'm going to show that the consumption relative to GDP declined precisely at the same time when the energy intensity of the GDP increased. So the two things actually went in the opposite uh, direction. So clearly, it is not consumption. So I, I, I would argue at this point, the Chinese energy consumption is not driven by, by culture, uh, meaning by average Chinese, how they think about things and how they behave. It is m mostly driven by economic model and by government policies. This is consumption GDP ratio, um, and uh, uh, this is where we are, the most recent uh, data. Basically now, the Chinese consumption GDP ratio is uh, 35, 36% of the GDP. This is probably the lowest among any major economies that we know of. Um, the norm is 60% uh, among developing countries. Uh, for developed countries like the United States, we can argue the United States is over-consuming. There is more than 70%, right? What is, so, so there's that cross-country difference. What is more interesting is the changes in time. Uh, in the 1980s, and this is the period when the country experienced extremely fast growth. And in fact, if you look at a uh, lot of other data series, those data series would suggest that the 1980s the decade was associated with the fastest reduction of poverty, uh, with some improvement in income distribution, uh, things like that, broadly based economic growth. That was a period, and China used very little energy. China became a net importer of uh, energy around late 1990s. Before that, China, for many years, China was actually exporting oil to the rest of the world. And at that time, in the 1980s, China maintained a fairly high, by, by Chinese standard, 50%, fairly high consumption GDP ratio, right? By Chinese standard, this is low globally, but by Chinese standard, this is the height of the consumption to GDP ratio. And then it went down, went up a little bit, and sharply declined since the late 1990s. What is very interesting is, is something happened around this uh, period. Uh, and I think that period deserves uh, more analytical uh, attention. I, my own hypothesis is real estate, infrastructure, uh, uh, investments, uh, things like that, that require a lot of heavy industry, a huge uh, energy consumption, right? So why do you, uh, uh, why do you shift the development model uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a very, very interesting question. Uh, let me contrast China with the United States. Uh, now there's a lot of a debate about the global imbalances. Let me just say very quickly about the source of that global imbalances. Basically, U.S. is consuming at this level, and U.S. is uh, the, the ratio is uh, rising uh, in the in the late 1990s and early 2000s. In China, the ratio was declining. Basically, the gap between these two ratios is the source of all these tensions between China and the United States about exchange rate, about trade, about dumping. As long as that gap is increasing rather than narrowing, these tensions are not going to go away. Uh, China compared with other developing countries such as Brazil and South Africa. China compared with Korea and Japan. Um, China compare with India. So no matter how many other countries you bench benchmark China to, China's consumption GDP ratio is extraordinarily low. Right? And this is at a time when the GDP, by the way, GDP is a production-based metric. Right? When the domestic consumption is low and declining, 
the rest of the GDP has to be <laughs> absorbed somehow, right? It can be absorbed in one of the two ways. One is being exported to Europe, to the United States, and basically that was the strategy China had until the financial crisis. And the other way to absorb that was by investment, which is the strategy that China is using now to absorb that surplus production. The only downside of that, or there are other downsides uh, of that, uh, there, are lots of other, there are lots of downsides with the investment-driven strategy, including, for example, energy intensity of uh, GDP growth, pollution, and, and things like that. But the other downside of that strategy is that you basically are creating excess capacity down the road, right? And because investment in the long run is going to create excess capacity. So it's, it's almost like you're running against yourself and sooner or later something has to uh, happen outside of exports, outside of the investment to absorb this uh, production. So the hope, and, and this is where Chinese government is, the hope is that this line is going to rise up substantially to absorb the uh, surplus, the excess uh, capacity, and to, for that consumption to do that, you have to raise income. And Mary has done a lot of work on, on workers' uh, income. This is one of the little known facts about the Chinese energy consumption, electricity consumption, is that much of the consumption, so it's very different from the picture that uh, David uh, uh, presented. Uh, it's almost completely the flip side of the US consumption data. Uh, only about 12%, 14% of the Chinese electricity consumption is by the households. The rest is by industry. The rest is by industry, manufacturing and, and transport, but not personal transport, but goods transport. What is also interesting is that the peak of the personal consumption of uh, electricity, again, you know, Something happened here, right? So almost all the data series suggest that uh, something happened around this period, began to decline since the early 2000s, right? Um, and this is the average uh, personal energy consumption. There you actually see a different trend. What you see is the average uh, energy consumption is rising. So how do you reconcile this with, with that? First, the honest answer is I don't know, but let me hypothesize because we don't really have a lot of these uh, uh, data. One explanation could be that the high income group uh, in China is consuming a lot more energy now as compared with before. So they are, the high income group in China is converging with the US consumption in terms of maybe norm change or income, uh, income uh, effect but it didn't produce uh, a rising personal consumption to uh, total uh, electricity consumption because the vast majority of the population are not increasing their personal uh, consumption level. Um, sometimes in a country with very high income inequality, and probably if you calculate the Gini coefficient for energy consumption, electricity consumption, that Gini coefficient probably is also very high. When you have very high level of inequality, the average uh, data basically mean nothing. Uh, it should be the median, it should be, the, you should look at the standard deviation and things like that. The average, the mean level data don't mean much when you have very high level of uh, inequality. The problem with the official data is that we, we, that's all we have. We, we don't have any, anything else. That's why the Tsinghua University professor and I proposed doing a survey, because when you do a survey, you can actually have uh, individual and household data. You can look at the changes, uh, you can look at both of the mean level as well as the median level. Uh, and uh, this is the total uh, energy, uh, uh, electricity consumption, the red line, and this is the personal. So you can see the total uh, and, uh, electricity consumption has uh, risen much faster as compared with the household use. So basically, let me, uh, I want to have more discussion, so let me, let me just go through some of these slides very, very quickly. My own view, you know, that can be challenged, my own view is that um, 
that the, the whole problem is uh, the growth model, the investment growth model. Uh, Ma Jun did an excellent presentation. He talked about the changes in the way that Chinese leaders are proposing in the 12th five-year plan. And I think a lot of these uh, changes are, are very good, are very worthwhile, and, and they are very urgent uh, policy uh, objectives. My own concern is that if you read the five-year plan, the new five-year plan, much of the proposal is about government changing policies, government changing priorities. There's very little discussion on how, uh, uh, how to change what I view to be the central issue in the Chinese energy con uh, consumption, which is the role of the government itself. I, I believe that in the current uh, situation in China, the government is too intrusive. The government intervenes the market too much. They set the, uh, the, 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 the cost of the capital below the market rates. And uh, the small and medium enterprises, these are private enterprises, are not, who are usually more energy efficient than the SOEs, they are not getting the capital. So the one option for them, you know, we can criticize them, you know, criticize these entrepreneurs for dumping uh, polluted, uh, pollutants into the river, but that actually is one of the ways for them to reduce costs because they have to incur very high costs to raise capital then they are left with two other things. One is to exploit the workers, pay them very little money, and the other is to, to essentially inflict the social cost on the rest of the society. So I think the fundamental change I actually don't see in the five-year plan, which is to move away from the state, this model of state uh, capitalism, and actually increasing the consumption role of the Chinese GDP. And I own my own view is that when you do that, uh, the Chinese energy usage is going to decline per unit of the GDP generated. You may go from 11% of year to 9% of year, 8% of the year, but that's, you know, 8% of the year is already a, a very impressive uh, achievement. When you have 8% of the year, if you have rising wages and rising income, that is not going to produce the kind of political instability that many people fear that will be associated with the reduction of the growth rate. The key thing is not GDP growth. The key thing is actually not the top line growth. The key thing is whether or not the high GDP growth is going to translate into personal income growth. What we see in the data is that in the 1990s and since the early 2000s, there's this big divergence between the GDP growth and personal income growth. So the key thing is, uh, is to close that gap by doing two things. One is that you bring down the GDP growth, and this is what the new five-year plan uh, is saying. You know, they are saying that we accept 7% growth. I think that's a very good uh, uh, policy position because when the central government says that they accept 7% growth, it has a lot of uh, 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 effects on the local governments you know, because they use the GDP growth to evaluate the performance of the local officials. That's one way, and the other way to, uh, to do that is to increase the personal uh, income growth. And let me just use this one slide to, to emphasize that the Chinese growth model, even though there is this view that the Chinese growth has been achieved because of state capitalism rather than despite state capitalism. Almost every microeconomic study contradicts this view. The more capitalistic provinces grow faster and uh, the more capitalist provinces have higher productivity growth and it will be very interesting to study and I, have, I haven't done that and I don't know of any studies that have done that whether or not the more capitalistic provinces in China also are more conservative in using energy or not, right? So it will be interesting to do that kind of uh, study um, because uh, 
uh, you, can, you can hypothesize that the uh, private entrepreneurs have an uh, intrinsic incentive to save on energy use because they have to incur personal costs when the energy uh, use is uh, expensive. Uh, let me, uh, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of slides, so let me, let me just uh, show um, one, maybe two more slides to underscore this point. And this is the difference between three different periods, uh, 1980s, 1990s, and the current period. And this is the GDP growth. So clearly, in, since 2003, there is this extra, uh, extra increment of the GDP growth um, as compared with 1990s and 1980s. But if you look at the GDP growth data, the three decades don't look terribly different, right? They all grow very fast, right? So above uh, 8%. When you look at the rural income uh, data, the three decades tell you very, very different stories. The 1980s, very high rural income growth. It collapsed in the 1990s. It began to recover uh, in the more uh, recent uh, decade, right? And the 1990s, uh, 1980s was the period when the consumption GDP ratio was at the highest level. And China, per unit of the GDP, uh, uh, was, was, was uh, improving. That, that uh, metric was uh, improving. So there are ways of organizing your economy to have high GDP growth, high personal income growth, high consumption growth, and improving energy efficiency, depending on how you organize the economic activities. In the 1980s and early part of the 1990s, much of the emphasis, policy emphasis, was on the rural part of the country, was on private entre uh, rural entrepreneurship. I believe that the data suggests that this is still the best model to, to grow. Um, Let me, let me show you another slide and then I will conclude. This is what has happened in China in the rural migrant uh, sector uh, in Guangdong. This is from the survey data that I organized with the uh, professors at Zhongshan University in Guangdong province. Um, and what you see is that the GDP growth uh, in Guangdong province has been very, very fast. This is per capita, real per capita GDP growth, and this is the rural migrant labor's income growth, right? And this is the, this, kind, this growth is the, the, the low personal income growth basically is the limiting factor on the personal energy consumption. Unless you get that growth uh, rate uh, uh, to converge with the GDP growth, what you're always going to see, what, what you are always going to see is that more of the energy is going to go into investment activities as opposed to the consumption. Everything else being equal, probably on the margin, you have an energy saving effect if the consumption is driving the GDP growth as opposed to investment. But the problem is when you have this kind of divergence between personal income growth and GDP growth, you can't really have personal consumption driving GDP growth, right? So the, the key issue here is, is, even though this is a conference about energy, not so much about economic development model, but the key takeaway of this slide is to achieve the energy saving effect. If we believe in the theory that the Chinese households are more energy saving, conditional on the same level of income, then you need to get the Chinese rural labor migrant workers' income to go up for that to be a driver of the GDP growth. Okay. Let me just, okay, so I did it too fast, but the last slide basically says thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>